Like the internet didn't get created because people sat down and tried to figure out how do I, uh, you know, uh, send TikTok videos of myself dancing to people. They, you know, it was, there's an application. I mean, actually, I don't even know what how. What do you think the application for the internet was when it was? It must have been very low level, basic network communication within DARPA, like military based, like how do I send like a networking how do I send information securely between two places? Maybe it was an encryption. I'm totally speaking totally outside of my knowledge, but like it, it was probably intended for a very narrow, small group of people. Well, so, I mean, it was, there was like this small community of people who were really interested in time-sharing computing and like interactive computing uh, yeah. in contrast with uh, batch processing. And then the idea that as you set up like a time-sharing center, uh, basically meaning you can have multiple people like logged in and using that like central computer. Um, why not make it accessible to others? Yeah. And this was kind of what I had always thought like, oh, is this like fringe group that was interested in this new kind of computing and they all like got themselves together. But the thing is like DARPA wouldn't act, you wouldn't have the US government funding that just for the funds of it, right? But in some sense, that's what ARPA was all about was uh, like just really advanced research for the sake of having advanced research and it doesn't have to pay out with utility soon. But uh, the core parts of its development were happening like in the middle of the Vietnam War when there was budgetary constraints all over the place. Uh, I only learned this recently, actually. Like, If you look at the documents basically justifying the um, budget for the ARPANET as they were developing it, um, and not just keeping it where it was, but actively growing it while all sorts of other departments were having their funding cut because uh, of the war, um, a big part of it was national defense in terms of having like a more robust communication system, mm -hmm. um, like the idea of packet switching versus circuit switching. You could kind of make this case that in some calamitous circumstance where, you know, a central location gets nuked, uh, this is a this is a much more resilient way to still have your communication lines that like traditional um, telephone lines weren't as resilient to, which I just found very interesting yeah. is that that... Um, even something that we see as so happy-go-lucky is just a bunch of computer nerds trying to get like interactive computing out there. The actual like thing that made it uh, funded and thing that made it advance uh, when it did was because of this direct national security question and concern. I don't know if you've read it. I haven't read it. I've been meaning to read it, but Neil deGrasse Tyson actually came out with a book that talks about like science in the context of the military, like basically saying all the great science we've done in the, in the 20th century was like because of the military. I mean, he paints a positive, it's not like a critical, it's not, you know, a lot of people say like military industrial complex and so on. Another way to see the military and national security is like a source of, like you said, deadlines and like hard things you can't move. Like almost, you know, almost like scaring ourselves into being productive. <laughs> it is that, I mean, yeah. the Manhattan Project is a perfect example, yeah. probably the quintessential example, that one, uh, is a little bit more macabre than others because of like what they were building. But in terms of how many focused, smart hours of human intelligence get pointed towards um, a topic per day, you're just maxing it out with that sense of worry. In that context, everyone there was saying like, we've got to get the bomb before Hitler does. And that, like, that just lights a fire under you that I, again, like the circumstance is macabre, but I think that's actually pretty healthy, especially for researchers that are otherwise going to be really theoretical to take these like theorizers and say, make this real physical thing happen. Um, meaning a lot of it is gonna be unsexy. A lot of it's gonna be like young Feynman sitting there kind of inventing uh, a, a notion of computation in order to like compute what they needed to compute more quickly with like the rudimentary automated tools that they had available. Um, I think you see this with Bell Labs also where you've got otherwise very theorizing minds in very pragmatic contexts that I think is like really helpful for the theory as well as for the applications. Uh, so I, th I think that stuff can be positive for progress.